everyone and welcome to the Namibia Outdoor Adventure webinar. My name is Terry Levine and I'm here with the Namibia Tourism Board's North American office. To give you a little background on outdoor adventure in Namibia, Namibia's vast and varied landscape is the ideal launching pad for a range of outdoor adventure outdoor adventures, from leisurely pursuits to the more extreme. The adventure centers of Lydris on Namibia's southwestern coast, as well as Swakopmund and Walvis Bay on the central coast are gateways to many of the country's outdoor experiences. So to give you sort of an agenda of what we're going to cover today, I'm going to run you through, um, sort of introduce you to uh, the Namibia Tourism Board's North American Public Relations Team. We're going to talk about where the, the country is located and how you can get there. And then I'm going to turn it over to freelance writer Adam Fisher, who's going to tell you about his recent experiences in Namibia um, and self, his self-drive itinerary. And then David Cartwright with ATI Holidays is going to run us through an outdoor adventure itinerary. Um, so uh, to kick it off, um, there are three folks on the Namibia Tourism Board's North American Public Relations team. You see myself on the right. Um, and then two of my colleagues, Tara Lee Barnes and Malcolm Griffiths, also can help um, with, any, uh, with any media needs. Um, so to give you a brief overview of where Namibia is located, it's in southern Africa, but it's in southwestern Africa, you see here. Um, the country is about half the size of Alaska, and it's about the same size as Germany and France combined. It borders a number of different countries, including Angola, Botswana, South Africa, Zambia, and Zimbabwe. And there are multiple ways to get to Namibia, too, whether uh, through the state's flagship carrier, Air Namibia, that has daily flights from Frankfurt, or using um, other carriers, including British Airways, um, South African Airways. And it's important to note that South African Airways has multiple flights um, from New York and then also Washington, D.C. Um, so right now, I'd like to turn it over to writer Adam Fisher, who's going to tell us a little bit about uh, I'm in Namibia and the places it's on a self-drive itinerary, which include Walvis Bay, Toast National Park, Damaraland, and the Ugab and Huab Rivers. So Adam, take it away. So yeah, I'm a, I'm a travel writer, but, um, but I was not... Uh, initially intending to do a travel story when I was in N Namibia. I was actually sent over there to live for a month in, um, in Walvis Bay. And Walvis Bay is kind of the twin of uh, Swakopmund. It's on the coast. And Swakopmund is a little more touristy. Walvis Bay is a little more industrial. But Walvis Bay is built around this incredible bay, which happens to be one of the best uh, speed sailing locations in the world. That's what my story was on. And um, uh, it's an amazing place to, to uh, have a boat or learn to kiteboard. Um, uh, it's something I did there, and it's got to be one of the best locations in the world for kiteboarding. Not only the wind uh, predictable and strong, but uh, there's a lagoon on the southern end there, which is which is shallow and, uh, you know, soft and, and just really easy on, on a learner. Um, so I, I really fell in love with this little kind of dusty frontier town of Walvis Bay. It's, it's basically built around an incredible bar called The Raft, which is literally in the middle of Walvis Bay on, uh, on piers. You have to kind of get it, walk out on a catwalk to get to it. And, uh, you know, it's full of all kinds of characters who are coming through Namibia, not just sailors and kind of adventure travel types, but uh, aero sports guys who um, are flying gliders inland and uh, biologists and vacationers of all stripes and, and quite a lot of outdoorsmen, outdoorsy type of people from South Africa. And uh, what I realized is I had, as a kind of outdoorsy type of person from California, is that I had a lot of, in common with these, these people. And, and, uh, and uh, they 
basically showed me that there is no need to really book a tour if you didn't want to. Um, it's very efficient, but I had a lot of time. Um, what you could do is just, you know, go camping. And uh, in fact, um, because of the rise of the self-drive industry, going camping is as easy as you know, going up to Swakopmund and, and um, renting a truck, uh, which is already has four-wheel drive. You can get a tent on top or two pop-up tents on top. comes with a, 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 a fridge in the back, a spare tire. It, it, mine actually came with, like, all, all the camping equipment I could possibly need, including a table and chairs and a um, and the tablecloth in a full set of silverware and dishes and soap and everything. All I had to do after I got uh, my camping vehicle was um, just go to the grocery store. In the cities, the grocery stores are as first world as anything uh, I've ever seen in, in the States. You load up on food and firewood and beer, and you just light out for the territories, as we say. Um, so the way I did it, was I went from Wallace first up to Atosha, which is a must-see, um, not just in Namibia, but I, I'm told the kind of the best game park in possibly all of Africa, and uh, I was not dis disappointed. You can drive around. You can see basically every, you know, the big five, as it were. And you, see, I, uh, you know, I saw big cats. I saw lots and lots of elephants. I saw um, some rhinos. I saw... Um, you know, all kinds of antelope and ostriches, etc. You actually uh, you could stay in the lodges, or uh, since I had a camping vehicle, I stayed in uh, camps. So these camps are they're very similar to uh, what we have in the states of KOA, like an improved campground. They have um, you know a place to um, you know a place to grill up your your meat and and uh, a you know, a picnic table. Um, but after a couple days of that, I I kind of I kind of felt a little penned in. There is a fence around the perimeter of this giant space, and in fact, at night you are fenced into the campgrounds, which was a little uh, it was a little too controlled for me. And so, although I had a wonderful time in Natasha, I decided to really go for it and went it into uh, went uh, let's see went west into Damaraland, which is a truly, truly wild um, part of Namibia, and yet only a couple hours away from civilization. And since I was equipped with a, a special GPS um, uh, that had a special map called Tracks for Africa, um, I was able to see every tiny, tiny road that existed through the entire territory with notations you know, um, penciled into the margins electronically, of course, about where the animals were typically were, where campsites were, where water was, where good views were, where places that may be a little too hectic were, you know, uh, grades that were too steep, rocks that were too sharp and likely to cut my tires. And, and just looking at the map and, you know, uh, driving by whim, um, I, through about, but with about five, about a week's worth of driving around and sightseeing, I, I saw all the animals that I saw in Atosha, but truly, truly in the wild. And in fact, um, I realized I could track them. Uh, I'm no, I'm no tracker, but um, it's, as it turns out, finding an ele a, a herd of elephants walking down a river is actually a lot, a lot easier than it sounds when you're telling your friends back home. They make a, they, they, they pull down a lot of branches. Every place they step, if it's muddy, there's a giant pool of, you know, a, a puddle where their foot was, and, and they leave giant piles of dung behind. So it's so exciting to, to, to track, you know, be my own safari guide. And um, and uh, we ran around uh, Tomorrowland and Grand, Grandberg Mountain and, you know, Doros Crater and 
And then, and then finally, when we ran out of uh, time and food, we hit, you know hit the Skeleton Coast and, and drove back to um, Walpus Bay. Now, this is not a trip for the faint of heart. I, I would definitely not do it if uh, you don't feel you wouldn't feel doing a similar thing in say. Nevada or Arizona or what have you. And I definitely would not do it without, uh, like I said, maps for Africa, without a good four-wheel drive with spare tires, without, you know, um, at least some off-road driving experience and at minimum the ability to change a tire by herself. And finally, I would absolutely would, would not do it without a satellite phone and the phone number of a tour operator or some kind of local who would agree to, um, you know, come come get you out of trouble if, if you know, you really did get in trouble. Um, in my case, my, my deal was with um, Gary, the owner of the raft that I mentioned, the, the bar in Walvis Bay. He also has a, a safari co uh, company, and he, he um, was kind enough to point out some places, put some waypoints on the GPS where he thought uh, I'd like to go. So it's not truly unsupported, um, but, uh, you, you know, uh, I guess my message is, you know, this is how the, the locals do it, and, and there's actually no re reason that uh, an outdoorsman, you know, from from the United States, who's comfortable with camping, can't do it too. It's 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 easy to put together. It's very inexpensive, and if you have time, um, it's you know it, you'll, you'll you'll invariably come at, back with uh, uh, a lot of stories and um, the satisfaction of doing it all yourself. Well, thanks so much, Adam for um, running us through your experiences in Namibia. Um, now I'd like to turn it over to David Cartwright from ATI Holidays, who's going to talk through um, an iconic uh, outdoor adventure itinerary. David? Hi. Yeah, hi. My name is David Cartwright. I'm the uh, owner and CEO of ATI Holidays, based in Vinter, the capital of Namibia. I'm going to chat about a, an easily accessible adventure experience that I believe any of you can take part in. It's a presentation about a road trip that's going to take in some of those beautiful and, and iconic locations in Namibia. We're going to do this with a little bit more comfort. We're going to be staying at lodges and good quality facilities as we go around the country. So it's slightly different to what Adam's done. As Adam mentioned, though, you know, self-driving in Namibia is an easy, it's, it's safe, it's a wonderfully liberating experience. It truly really is the only African nation where getting about the country under your own, own steam is stress-free and, and very doable often leaving it to be described as Africa for beginners. Our roads are a mixture of sealed tar services and well-maintained gravel tracks. They're signposted, they're well-maintained, and they're largely empty. It's still very important, I think, to have a carefully crafted and a balanced route that ensures distances are never too great and encompasses all that you want to do. A good local agent will help plan and provide a detailed itinerary and a roadmap for your journey. Some companies, like mine, will provide an inclusive free telephone and medical evacuation and treatment insurance, giving that little bit of extra peace of mind and that support, which I think is so important when you're on the road. Getting back to self-driving, I think a night in town is also essential. Getting that opportunity to catch your breath and plant your feet firmly on African soil after the long flight. It's also a chance to chat your holiday through with your holiday planner and make sure that you understand where you're going, you've answered any last minute questions, and that you understand how your car works. Like Adam, I recommend a 4x4. Um, I don't think it's, it's necessary on most routes, but it gives you comfort and stability, and that little bit of extra height for game viewing. And of course, a 4x4 facility, should your route take you off the beaten track. Now the first stop, on this itinerary is Okunjima Lodge. It's home to the Africa Foundation, who have been working for many years to help preserve and stabilize our once diminishing cheetah population. Namibia supports 25% of the world's cheetahs. 90% of these are found on farmlands. So there's obviously some conflict. 
They have spent 18 years rescuing and releasing over a thousand cheetahs and leopards, making it the largest rehab program in the world. You'll be spending two incredible days at the adjoining Okanjima Lodge, tracking leopard on foot or in the vehicle, looking for leopard, visiting the Africat Education and Research Center, and learning a little bit more about their important work. And the profits from the lodge go straight back into the conservation work, uh, so that you can experience it and get close to these, these beautiful and indeed rare big cats. Next is a little bit of culture. And uh, we're going to be staying at the Nyoma Camp. Nyoma Camp is, uh, is a bit of an extraordinary journey. We're going into the Nai Nai lands of the uh, nomadic sand bushmen. These are the original inhabitants of southern Africa. They've been in the region for over 20,000 years and still maintain something of a, a traditional lifestyle. The tribe we're talking about and we're visiting are the Zutwasi. The Zutwasi are the largest of the remaining sand groups. Um, they virtually had no contact with civilization until the 1950s, and they still hunt on the land of their ancestors, and, and as I say, live a traditional life, although they have been touched by outside civilization, so don't expect them to be wearing uh, bits of loincloth and, and skin, but you will get an insight into how they live in the 21st century. The camp is, is a symbiotic partnership between local operator, Arno, uh, Uster Hazen, who's been there since 83, and uh, the local community. He creates the lodge environment and, uh, on the side of their village, and they create the activities and, and this extraordinary experience to sample and spend some time with these people. You'll get the chance to meet the 30 adults and 60 children. The hunters may demonstrate how they make arrows. Possibly as the evening goes on, they have impromptu trance and healing dances around the fire. The following day, spend a day out with us at Wasi, walking with the hunters, looking for fresh tracks, collecting bush food, demonstrating how they use water roots when they're hunting, and all the bush food and medicine that they find along the way. It was an extraordinary experience, and um, it's survived and supported by 200 to 250 visitors per year. So like in most places in Namibia, it's going to be very quiet, but this is enough to create and support this community. It's now time for to do a bit more serious big game spotting, and I'm going to go to uh, the Itoshi National Park. Uh, the park itself is it's the third largest park in Africa, uh, 13,838 miles squared, I believe. It's, it's about the same size as Switzerland, and its centre is dominated by what was once a huge inland sea that dried up over two million years ago. Uh, a remarkable spectacle in itself. But getting back to the game. Itosha has a spectacular diversity of animals, 114 different mammals, 340 birds, 112 reptile species, and uh, one variety of fish. Uh, of the big five, it's only buffalo that are absent as the, the dry environment doesn't support the grazing. But the remainder of the animals, the elephants are there, quite literally, in their thousands. There's a healthy lion population of around about 350 to 500. Black and white rhino are present, along with a range of plains animals, um, such as zebra, giraffe, kudu, chamsbok. Spectacular driving. But I think the real beauty of Itosha, and, and what sets it aside from so many other parks, is its accessibility. Simply, it's user-friendly and, and it's very affordable. It's supported by an extensive network of roads that link the numerous watering holes together, allowing you to meander at your leisure between them. The secret here is not to rush, but often to park up under the shade of a camel thorn tree and let the animals come to you. Your first night, I, I plan to be spent on the eastern flank at the beautifully redeveloped Onkuma Lodge. Here, you can relax after the day's drive from Bushman Land in the comfort of the bar. Watch the animals come down to the waterhole and join you for a drink. It's, it's a perfect end to any African safari day. The next day, though, it's going to be a little bit more exciting and we planned a full day's game drive, crossing over half the park to the Okakuya rest camp. An early start is central, getting into the park as the gates open for dawn. It's simply the best time, fantastic light for photography, and the time to catch animals still active before the heat of the day drives them into the cover of the bushes. Make it a slow drive, dropping into water holes en route, and hoping that luck is on your side. 
I break in the centre located a law, like it's, it's a good idea in the heat of the day, and I drop off and drop off and relax in the pool for a while. Okakia uh, is the original Itosha rest camp, and it's most famous for its waterhole. It's probably the most famous waterhole in southern Africa. Um, I suggest you take an early dinner, accompany yourself with a great bottle of wine, make your way down to the waterhole, and let the performance begin, because that's what it is. It's pure theatre. Animals simply appear oblivious to the camp and the neon lights, or the people sitting on the benches behind the low, low stone wall. The light doesn't penetrate the surrounding bushes, but it creates something of a stage with the water at its center, focusing the attention on the animals that come to drink. During the dry season, April to November, you're bound to see some remarkable interactions of animals jostling for the right to quench the thirst. Regular star performers, elephant, lion, jackal, and of course, black rhino. Talking of rhino, we're now going to continue west. Uh, into uh, the Palmbog area and, and discuss one of Namibia's wonderful conservation stories. Um, we're going over the group that pass into Palmbog, and where I've got two nights planned in one of the most remote and beautiful regions of Namibia. You're going to be tracking the world's last free roaming black rhino on foot, uh, courtesy of Save the Rhino Fund and staying in the beautiful Edwardian wilderness safaris desert rhino camp. Black rhinos critically endangered species whose numbers worldwide were just 2,400 a matter of six years ago. It's now sort of on the brink of extinction, but in Namibia, it's again began to thrive in this sparse and remote environment. Numbers are increasing nationally by, by fourfold in the last 20 years to 2,500. This incredible conservation success story is, is down to the work of the foundation who, recru who recruited the poachers and made them the protectors. And they also ensured that traditional communities benefited in terms of tourist revenue. So your stay there is going directly into the pockets of the people in the community that live in that area. Leave your guide behind and drive into this enormous 450,000 hectare reserve and spend the time walking and learning about these beautiful animals and the remarkable work of the, of the guides. It's also worth noting that a, a percentage I've said does go directly to save the rhino fund as well. Other animals, hey, well, if you don't see rhino, there's the elusive branaina, desert adapted elephant, lion, cheetah, offering a wonderfully unexploited and, and exclusive view of wildlife in a very, very natural environment. We're rooting now uh, south and towards the coast. And we're going to be spending a night at the, at the lovely Kipwee Lodge near Twyfelfontein. Uh, for me, it, it's probably the most beautiful area of Namibia. And it's home to uh, the Twyfelfontein UNESCO World Heritage Site, um, which directly translates as a doubtful spring. It, it, it contains the largest collection of rock engravings uh, in southern Africa. There's about 2,000 of them. Some of them are Neolithic, some are much younger. Uh, but an extraordinary collection. A local guide could take you around the monument and explain the techniques and the stories that you've created these pictures. Now, when the day is done, as I said, Camp Cape Point, a beautiful place, kick back, unwind, and enjoy gin and tonic. So, uh, attention now turns to the coast, the hauntingly desolate, lonely, romantic skeleton coast. You're going to head towards it and then drive down the section of this coast, which was the graveyard to so many ships and people. And heading into the Swakopmund, which is Namibia's premier uh, coastal playground, close to Walfus, that Adam chatted about. The town itself is it's an intriguing mix of German architecture, monuments, historic buildings, but beautiful, well-maintained gardens and palm-lined avenues, some great coffee bars and seafood restaurants, and incidentally, fantastic oysters and crayfish. I mentioned playground, and that's exactly what it is. It's a home of numerous adrenaline-based activities, such as sandboarding, you can get speeds of up to 70 kilometers down the dunes, high-octane quad biking, tandem free-falling, skeleton coast scenic flights. I personally rather like to get out on the water, so sea kayaking is a wonderful way to spend a morning. <laughs> Sharing the lagoon with countless cape fur seals and, and dolphins. 
Alternatively, take the catamarans out and go and look for our two species of dolphin, the heavy side and the bottle nose. Wash that down with uh, a little bit of our local champagne, and you might even see humpback or something like whale if you're lucky. It's, uh, it's a lot of fun, and there's a lot to do there. I think it's an essential part of any itinerary. The last destination, though, on this tour of, of iconic Namibia is Sotisfle. It's in the heart of the Namib Desert. It's home to the highest dunes and the oldest desert on Earth. If you've ever seen a picture of Namibia, nine times out of ten, this is probably where it was taken. Endless, timeless, 360-degree vistas that the words simply don't do justice to. It's a scale that gives a different perspective to your own significance. It's um, really quite awe-inspiring and, and frankly leaves you found feeling fairly insignificant. The name Namib, not surprisingly, translates simply as just fast. The colours, the light, the beauty are all remarkable and should form an essential part of any trip to Namibia. Clearly, a trip into Sotisfle is the, the main activity in this area. And like Itosha, it's best enjoyed at dawn. The sand's cool, the colours are the most vibrant, and you can easily self-drive into the park. Though the last section of the road is 4x4 only. You can walk, leave the car behind, it's five kilometers, it's a beautiful walk. Alternatively, take a local guide from the lodge into the dunes, and you can take breaths in the shade of an old acacia tree and, and discuss the beauty of and, and the desert what formed it. And for those of you who've got a penchant and a budget for the highlight, the desert can also be enjoyed by a blue, drifting where the wind takes you have the endless sand fields, all rounded off with a champagne breakfast. The accommodation I've selected here is Hudia. Hudia uh, is just 12 uh, luxury air-conditioned double rooms, um, relaxing, safe, and beautiful environment. From here, we're going to head back to Vintook. After what I hope will have been truly a, a journey of a lifetime, you'll come back into town, drop off the car, and uh, return to the airport for your flight home. Now, a trip of this nature will cost somewhere in the region of four and a half thousand US dollars. But of course, as uh, we've already discussed with Adam, prices vary enormously. It's up to you. It's up to your budget. It's what you want to do. At my company, HI Holidays, we can create a variety of different trips, tailor-made to suit your budget, your interests, and your time, what you want to do. It might be camping. It might be guided. You might want to fly. Or self-driving is what I've been doing for the last 10 years around Namibia. And I personally believe it's the best way to enjoy and see Namibia. Please drop me an email. The uh, details are on screen, uh, but it is david at infotour, I-N-F-O-T-O-U-R hyphen africa.com. If you've got any questions, I'd love to hear from you. Thank you very much. Thanks so much, David, for running us through that iconic itinerary. I wish I was on it right now. So to sort of wrap up, um, there are multiple outdoor activities that people visiting Namibia can participate in. We heard a little bit about each of these, about some of these from both Adam and David, um, but here's a comprehensive list um, for those watching the webinar right now. Um, if you have any questions about Namibia, traveling to Namibia, the visiting journalist program, or really anything about the country, free, feel free to email me at terry.levine at aboutdci.com. And so in conclusion, just wanted to say thank you so much um, first to Adam and David for being on this webinar and helping us to understand a little bit more about Namibia and the outdoor adventures travelers can participate in. You'll see up here you have my contact information as well as David. Um, and on behalf of all of us, we just want to thank you so much for a lovely, um, for a great time uh, spending on this webinar and appreciate it. So 